What's up my friend, Abby here, and welcome back to Ask Abby, where I answer your writing questions and help you make your story matter. Today's question comes from It's Me Lala. Hi Abby, I always enjoy your videos because they teach me so much in a short time. Also loving your voice. <laughs> my question, how can I avoid an info dump, but get enough information to the reader? My story starts with my character working in a dystopian world, and I fear it would be too confusing for the reader as many specifics are not explained. At the same time, I don't want to start the story with explaining the world as I want to focus on the character at the start. Thank you for the awesome content. So first of all, you are 100% right with starting the story with the character. That's what matters the most. Many writers make the mistake of starting the story by explaining the world, and there is no quicker way to lose the reader's interest because we don't care about the world. We have no reason to care about the world, the government, the society, the magic system, any of it. We care about the characters and what matters to them. That being said, I think there is a way to introduce the world and all of its complexities through the character in such a way that not only do we understand everything, but we feel familiar with this world. The secret is to start small. I know you probably have all kinds of notes and histories and maps and legends and societies and cultures, but I want you to forget all of that for now. In the very beginning, we only want to know what immediately matters to the main character. Then as their world gets bigger, our world gets bigger. This is the concept of exposition through action, and it follows the natural flow of cause and effect. When you pause the main character's action to tell us about the world, to explain something to us, you are stopping that natural flow of cause and effect. You're stopping the action. Our brain struggles to find relevancy and interest in this piece of information because it's just that, a piece of information. Why is it here? Why am I looking at it? Why does it matter? So pinpoint your main character, draw a small circle of reality around them, and then show me what that reality looks like. Let's look at a few story examples of this. I'm going to use book examples this time because it's much trickier to paint a picture with words and to world build with words than it is to show an image or a scene in a film or any other visual form of storytelling. The first good example that comes to mind is Cinder, which is the first book in the Lunar Chronicles series by Marissa Mayer. It's a sci-fi retelling of Cinderella and takes place in a futuristic world full of magic and monarchs and high-tech gadgets. But the opening scene doesn't show us the whole complex universe. Instead, the first chapter focuses on what is immediately impacting the main character. It's a very small circle of reality. Cinder is working as a mechanic in the marketplace. She's a cyborg. She's trying to fix her mechanical foot. We only see what matters to her. Cinder was the only full service mechanic at New Beijing's weekly market. Without a sign, her booth hinted at her trade only by the shelves of stock android parts that crowded the walls. It was squeezed into a shady cove between a used net screen dealer and a silk merchant, both of whom frequently complained about the tangy smell of metal and grease that came from Cinder's booth, even though it was usually disguised by the aroma of honey buns from the bakery across the square. Cinder knew they really just didn't like being next to her. As the chapter unfolds, we start to get a better understanding of the world and the society that Cinder finds herself in. How cyborgs are looked down upon by most people. How there's this deadly plague that everyone's afraid of. And how talking androids are a common occurrence. Prince Kai set down the foot and turned his attention to the shelves of old and battered parts. Parts for androids, hovers, net screens, port screens. Parts for cyborgs. They say you're the best mechanic in New Beijing. I was expecting an old man. Do they? She murmured. He wasn't the first to voice surprise. Most of her customers couldn't fathom how a teenage girl could be the best mechanic in the city, and she never broadcast the reason for her talent. The fewer people who knew she was a cyborg, the better. 
She was sure she'd go mad if all the market shopkeepers looked at her with the same disdain as Chang Sacha did. By staying super close within the perspective of the main character, we feel like we're seeing the world through their eyes. And if the main character stops and explains the world to the reader, it feels a little bit forced because you would never stop to explain your world to yourself. We learn about the world by watching the characters navigate it. However, one thing that can cause confusion sometimes is too much jargon. A lot of sci-fi and fantasy writers like creating new words and languages to describe things because it's kind of cool and unique. And yes, you do want some jargon, but use it sparingly and try to make it as logical as possible so that we're not doing mental gymnastics trying to figure out that a spoonyadigazator is a soap dispenser. For example, in Cinder, nobody stops to explain what a net screen is, but it's pretty obvious that it's a screen connected to the internet. So basically a computer or a tablet. So yes, you can use jargon and make up your own words, but try to use it sparingly so that you're not mentally exhausting your reader. Another good example of world building done right would be the first chapter of Shadow and Bone by Lee Bardugo. The Grishaverse world is so dazzling and colorful and richly developed. I absolutely love the world building in this series. There are different countries and societies and legends and magic and religions, but none of that is revealed in the first chapter of the first book. Instead, we see this. Standing on the edge of a crowded road, I looked down onto the rolling fields and abandoned farms of the Tula Valley and got my first glimpse of the Shadowfold. My regiment was two weeks' march from the military encampment at Politznaya, and the autumn sun was warm overhead. But I shivered in my coat as I eyed the haze that lay like a dirty smudge on the horizon. Again, this is a very small, very simple conflict. Our protagonist, Alina, is a cartographer marching with her regiment to the Shadowfold, which is this creepy, mystical divide between two cities that supposedly is filled with man-eating monsters. She's going to have to cross it, and she is reasonably scared. Well, then what's all this? I asked waving a hand at him. You look like you're on your way to a really good dinner instead of possible death and dismemberment. Mal laughed. You worry too much. The kings sent a whole group of Grisha pyros to cover the skiffs, and even a few of those creepy heart renders. We have our rifles, he said, patting the one on his back. We'll be fine. A rifle won't make much difference if there's a bad attack. This is another good way to cover world building ground through dialogue. You can convey that sense of familiarity and normalcy, and you can also reveal something about the characters as they discuss the world and kind of have differing opinions about it. In Shadow and Bone, we experience the world through the eyes of the protagonist, Alina, who doesn't really know much about the world or about the Grisha or their powers until she becomes one. As her world gets bigger, our world gets bigger. So at this point, you can probably see a pattern. Main characters experiencing their world in a very small and personal way. We see what matters to them, how they fit into the world, and what is immediately impacting them. Once you make your reader care about your character on a personal level, we can go deeper into the world and explore more of its complexities. Hopefully that answers your question. If you want to dive deeper into this whole topic of world building, definitely check out the podcast that me and my sister did on this topic pretty recently. The link to that will be in the description and also at the end of this video. If you would like your question answered here on Ask Abby, there are two ways to submit questions to the show. The first way is to hit the join button below this video, get inside the YouTube community and post your question in a comment on the community post. The second way is to go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons, get inside the Inner Circle Facebook group and post your question there. Just make sure you hashtag it Ask Abby so that I see it. And maybe next time I will answer your question. Throughout the month of November, I'm going to be taking a small break from Ask Abby because NaNoWriMo, we're all gonna be writing, working on writing projects. I'm gonna be really deep into some writing projects. So I'm going to be focusing on that 
during the month of November, but you can still submit questions to Ask Abby as I will be doing Write With Me live streams every Wednesday in November and I will be able to answer your questions there on the live. Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already because I post writing videos every Wednesday and I would love to have you here in the community. Until next week, my friend, rock on. How the world building that starts very small. And I think that everything, right. all the world building that I've seen that's really well done, yours included, in the blood race is very small in that it starts from like the one main character, then you care about the main character, you get to know them, and then you see what is immediately impacting them.